Okay, aloha. <coughs> Good morning from uh, beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, my name is Jürgen Steinmetz um, with um, Ito Bernus and Rebuilding.Travel. We're really uh, pleased to have so many of you joining us um, on this beautiful morning or evening or night or wherever you are. Um, I can see, again, we have people coming in from all kinds of the world. Special thank you again to our um, uh, friends that are joining us almost every time. I see Deepak here. Of course, uh, Taleb Refa is our um, co-chair. We see Cuthbert Nikubi from South Africa. Uh, we're, we're seeing, of course, my partner, uh, Dr. Peter Tarlow. And um, it's um, humbling to see that so many of you are joining us. And it's also encouraging uh, that we're able to contribute our little part to get players in the travel and tourism industry together worldwide to discuss this terrible situation our industry has been sliding into. It has been a very eventful week for, or two weeks since we last saw you. Um, and um, specifically here in the United States, I think it deserves maybe a special dis discussion. Um, the United States became pretty much the epic center of the virus outbreak. I can give you a little bit background what is happening here in my home state, what is Hawaii. We're a little bit far away from everyone else. Uh, the closest city on the mainland US is 2,550 miles or more than 4,000 kilometers away from here. So we are kind of isolated. We were supposed to open our state for tourism again on August 1st and just about on, on Monday, two days ago, our governor Ige um, rightfully, I think, decided to postpone uh, this opening now till September 1 or perhaps even later. Now this is good news for us who wanted to stay safe and healthy because we have the lowest number of COVID cases here in our state, even though it has been increasing for our, um, from our point of view from like two or three a day to now 20 to 30 a day. Um, but it's all explained by certain clusters and certain meetings and gyms and so forth. So um, our uh, state and city governments and county governments are taking immediate actions and it's small enough, I think, to keep it in check. Opening the gates for tourism um, definitely would post, in my opinion and an opinion <clears throat> also of many, including our uh, government great danger to our population and to the state. So I'm very happy about the decision. However, I'm not very happy for so many of my friends and everyone else working in the travel and tourism industry, what is a complete disaster. I can tell you for those that know Hawaii, I live right across the street from Ala Moana Shopping Center and it's a, it's a ghost town. Uh, Waikiki, you've never seen it that empty. Uh, even though hotels are now opening, restaurants are now, um, some of them are now opening. It's not the same type of atmosphere we had before. It's not a party city anymore. And I think that is pr pretty much the same for many of our destinations. I personally, I'm really concerned about the situation in Florida and Arizona at this time. These are both tourism um, headquarters and destinations. And, and uh, uh, when, when I... I um, and when, when I see um, feedback we're getting from Florida, it's quite humbling. Um, I know our friends, and you all know them from Buzz.Travel, who run Buzz.Travel. They were located actually in the Keys, and they literally escaped this morning. They're on a flight with no food right now, trying to get to Europe. They're on their way to Lisbon, and, and they're try, uh, trying to make it either to Germany or Madeira. So times have changed. Um, industry is in trouble. Time to work together. So what can we do next? And this should be an interactive discussion. It should not be a political discussion. I know the situation here in the United States specifically has been polarized by political messages. They don't help anyone. Um, but what does help is us, the experts, to come together, discuss, and we cannot change everything, but we can give recommendation and we can be noisy to get these type of recommendations out. Just on, on our own um, platform right now, we extended our platform from rebuilding.travel. What is the discussion you're participating? We will have uh, one discussion every two weeks, this time of the day. 
And then we have another discussion the next week, which is more favorable to Europe and to Africa and to uh, Asia on the other side of the world. And uh, we're bringing all the all these discussions together virtually so you can listen to everything and everyone as we encourage everyone to add not only comments but also suggestions we can add to the website and communicate. We therefore also opened another site it's also free there's no cost it's um, <clears throat> under resilience.travel where we now trying to collect all these various initiatives by um, or other organizations like the WTTC Safe Seal uh, Initiative, the initiative from Turkey, uh, and so forth, where we can collect all of this and uh, learn from each other. And then, of course, we have um, reopeningtourism.com for many destinations. That seems to be put in the background a little bit, but we have reopeningtourism.com, what is a commercial platform. There is a fee associated with it to post your reopening. And then, of course, we will also publish. Um, these type of messages on eTurbo News. However, we made an internal decision here on, I'm sorry, um, on, uh, for eTurbo News not to report um, either, whether it's either commercial or paid or non-paid messages um, about issues we feel they're unsafe. Um, I think we have to take a stand and uh, evaluate what we can publish and what we cannot publish. Um, as always, there is a blue hand on the right side when you click on uh, participants, you can raise. That means you can ask questions, you can talk, um, give us your situation. The only thing we ask, just keep, keep it short and don't get into political uh, fights because that wouldn't help everyone. And now I'm giving uh, my microphone to my colleague and partner in this um, initiative, Dr. Peter Tarlow, who's joining Thanks. us from College Station in Texas. Thank you. And as Jurgen likes to always start by saying aloha, I'll use the Texas word howdy. Uh, so it's midday here in Texas. It's an, again a very nice hot day. Uh, the weather forecasts in Texas are every day the same, hot and humid. So they'll change the weather forecast in October. Uh, just to get us going, and just as a, um, we spoke about this about two weeks ago, but it's kind of as a reminder. It's very clear that the tourism industry, especially in the United States, is really fighting four different battles all going on at the same time. They're interrelated and yet they're also separate. Certainly the most important battle and the most immediate is the issue of um, health, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, especially in the Southern tier states of the United States, we are seeing a, either a resurgence or the tail end of the first wave, depending upon which medical way you want to look at it. But there are large pockets of places that are having problems. We'll talk about Florida, Arizona. Texas um, is so big that it's really pockets within Texas. It's hard to think of Texas as one place. It's uh, it, from one side of the state to the other, it's 1,600 kilometers. And from the north, or 1,000 miles. And from the north to the south, 1,400 kilometers, or about 900 miles. So you can, I mean, the distances are enormous. But that's the first thing, and that's probably the most important. At the same time, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people have lost their job or are afraid of losing their job. And when people are in economic pain, they don't travel. So even if you're not sick or you're not afraid of getting sick, you may be afraid of the fact that if you spend the money and travel, can you make that money up? And so that becomes an issue right there. So there's an economic issue that is intertwined and yet separate. Right now in the United States, we're also going through an issue of in large cities in the United States are going through crime waves. There's this anti-police program. And again, we're not gonna go politically, but the, from the tourism perspective, when people are afraid, they don't travel. And so the issue of the crime wave is certainly impacting uh, how people are traveling or possibly will consider traveling. And we need to think of that, again, from the tourism perspective. How do we work to make people safe? Do we have the money to create areas so that people are not afraid to travel? And um, tourists need special attention in ways that uh, the local uh, population does not necessarily need. And finally, there's the issue within the tourism industry that it's lost a lot of credibility. People in the United States on the whole 
are one, not necessarily believing the media, and they're not necessarily believing the tourism ministry. And so if we use words that um, lead or promise more than we can deliver, people see us as basically just giving them a lot of um, misinformation, and that loss of credibility means that our advertising and our marketing falls apart. Now, in some way, these are interconnected. In some ways, they're separate. But I think we need to be thinking of each one of those as a way of getting things going. So one of the things that we want to point out is um, when we open the discussion, please feel free to talk. Again, please try not to make it political and as, uh, I leave Republicans and Democrats out or whatever you want. But uh, if you have something very specific, then we would be more than happy to contact us at rebuilding.travel and we can set up an individual uh, time to talk with you. And that will allow, um, because each, there's a general pattern, the macro, but there's also the micro. And just, you know, and we, I think we can say on some level, all tourism is local. And so if you have a specific problem, I know in my own state of Texas, we have some areas where we have some, a very serious situation in Houston, but I'm a hundred miles from Houston and College Station, while we do have a, certainly pockets of COVID, it's a university town. It's really divided between some of the university students who live in their own world and don't take the precautions they should and the general mass population. The other thing is we have to be very careful how we look at statistics. For example, very recently, they said that most of our hospitals here were filling up. What they neglected to say were that many of those people going to the hospitals were going for medical reasons other than COVID because we had postponed all elective surgery and now they could come back to the hospitals to take it. So we have to be very, very careful. The last thing I want to mention in statistics is there's a difference between numbers of people who are infected and the number of deaths per 100,000, which is the normal standard. So um, those are some of the issues and statistics. We have to be very careful that we're all using the same language and the same database in order to be able to communicate with each other. If not, we're going to have some, some, real, some, some real issues. So I wanted to start this off with that. Thank you um, for passing the microphone over. I think the issues for today are, what are specific things that we as an industry can do to attack those four problems or any other problem that I didn't mention? But I think those are our four immediate problems here in the United States. And the United States is so big that I think it touches everybody else on, on one level or another. So that's just to get the conversation going. And that's wonderful, Peter. <clears throat> Thank you for that. And uh, so uh, if you wanted to be part of this conversation, very easy, just uh, click on uh, raise your hand um, and uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. Maybe uh, we have Vanessa um, uh, raising her hand, um, but um, I'm wondering uh, since also uh, um, Talib uh, Rifa joined us, who's the former UNWTO Secretary General, um, I wanted to give him um, the uh, 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 with the microphone maybe for just a minute to uh, say hello and also maybe update us on, on the global uh, situation if that's okay, Talib. Aloha. 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 <laughs> Aloha. Okay. Hi. Howdy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for being with us tonight. You're yeah. learning to speak Texan. <laughs> Everybody has to nowadays. Yeah. All our eyes are on Texas and on Florida and San Francisco. Okay, the situation around the world, I know that you're gonna ask us not to be political, but I must say something that can touch on the political issue. Governments that have not been very strict and very firm in imposing the containment rules are paying the price now, unfortunately. You have developing countries that have done better than developed countries, strangely enough. They've done that because they have cracked down so strongly and so severely on the, on the epidemic, the containment. In Jordan, for example, here, the army was in the streets the second day and nobody was allowed to move for three weeks, four weeks. I'm sure that's the situation in many, many other countries around the world. But countries that have started to work in a different way and be lenient about it, not take it that seriously, are paying a heavier price now. 
That's a fact. Now, you have not seen the end of the story for sure. The story is not ended because even those that have cracked down on it. In Jordan, we have only 10 deaths now. There are 10 million people. Uh, Peter, we have only less than 1,000 infections. More than 800 have been recovered. So we have no problem in that. Yet, everybody is so worried still because the economic repercussions of this has been very heavy, number one. Number two, there is no guarantee for no, no turn around and come back with this disease. So what I want to say is it's not just an American issue, it's an international issue. The world is divided into two sides. One part that has cracked down so severely on this, and another part that has not taken it so seriously. The United States has not taken it so seriously, unfortunately. Now it's paying a fair price, but we don't know what the end of this story is going to be be there, either at, at either models of these two parts of the world. That's what I wanted to say now. And I would like, uh, Peter, to repeat again your four points, please. Just for sure. Yes. So, Let me repeat those four points. They're interconnected, but they're also separate. The tourism world is facing four key battles. The first one is obviously the issue of health, COVID-19, uh, health issues related. And by the way, it's not just COVID-19, because so much of the medical profession is working on COVID-19 that if someone gets sick with something else, they don't have the bed space or the ability to help people with other illnesses. So other illnesses are continuing in the same way. But there's the certainly is that, that's health. Second is we're fighting an economic battle because of large amounts of unemployment, because people are unsure of their um, economic well-being, they're afraid to travel. Thirdly, and again, this is right now, especially in the United States, but it could be in other parts of the world, the issue of crime, personal safety and security. People do not travel if they feel unsafe. Um, and lastly, the tourism industry and governments have got to work on the issue of credibility. If we say things over promise, we say things that are not true, we just come up with marketing strategies which are beautiful, but don't become real, reality, people stop believing us. And when they stop believing us, our entire marketing efforts collapse. So those four issues are, is, are essential. They're separate, but they're also intertwined. Can I make a suggestion that we discuss these four issues, basically, or anything that we say must relate to these four issues? That yes, we I, our discussion in a much better way. Yes. And I think they really touch the four key issues. Again, I'm speaking from an American perspective, but I think they touch people around the world. That's right. Make, make, makes a lot of sense. Uh, we did have uh, Vanessa Rodriguez uh, raising um, hand for quite some time. So maybe we give Vanessa um, the microphone. And, when, and as always, please let us know who you represent, where you're from. And uh, so we, uh, even though if I may, I may know you, but many others may not know you. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. My name is Vanessa Rodriguez. Um, I'm ca calling in here from Ohio in, in, the, U in the United States. And, um, you know, some of the topics that you were talking about, I um, I'm, were really feeling that impact. And I just, I, I wanted to just address with the group one of the issues that I'm finding, and I'm wondering if there's anyone there um, that might be able to assist. So I have travelers, for those who are not, who are prepared to travel, who don't have the economic battle um, are just really kind of frustrated of having to kind of not be able to to get out. Uh, they're they're reaching out to me as as a we're a tour company here in Ohio, and they want to travel. They they have interest. They have the finances, but obviously right now are having difficulty finding where can they travel to. Now. The challenge and the reason that I'm speaking up is because what I'm finding is, is that in order now to travel as a U.S. citizen to the Caribbean um, and in, in certain areas, they're requiring a negative COVID test that has been issued within seven hours to 72 hours prior to flight departure. The challenge that I'm finding is, is that testing is not, the results are not coming in within that time frame. And so I just wanted to ask the group if they're also experiencing this challenge. Is this something that we can in the industry get changed 
because testing is taking generally five to seven business days, not seven hours to 72 hours. And so that would be really helpful to be able to address for those who are, not, are, are able to travel and can afford to travel and, and, and really don't have concerns about safety and security in the areas which they want to travel to. Yeah, that's a real, a very valid uh, point. Hopefully a solution is coming down the pike, but it's hope, so hope is eternal. And that is that they're hoping to be able to give you tests almost as you're getting on the plane. In other words, there'll be instant, instant testing. One of the problems that the, and I work with countries such as Jamaica and across the Caribbean, so I know the Caribbean extraordinarily well. But one of the problems is, is that the um, tests are not necessarily accurate. And so a lot of people are now speaking about double testing, testing before you get on the plane and testing after you get on the plane. And that leads to a whole bunch of other questions. What happens if I get on the plane and I'm negative, I get off the plane and I'm positive, and then there's, who sends me back? What happens if they won't let me in? So um, we're going to, uh, I, it really behooves the travel industry to push as quickly as possible for rapid and positive, and when I mean positive, I don't mean people sick, but rapid and accurate, that's a better word, and, and accurate testing so that we will actually be able to show certification. I can tell you, looking at it from the Caribbean side, it would be a disaster if you allowed people to come in and bring in COVID. I mean, because those people will spend a little bit of money, but it will literally destroy the industry and could run through the countries. The other okay. thing that the Caribbean has to think about is that they do not have the medical infrastructure that Europe or the United States has. So if they ended up with say 100 people with COVID in a pocket, they may not have the ventilators, they may not have the medical personnel, they may not have the um, PPP and the, uh, the protective equipment and the um, uh, medications necessary. So they're, number, so they're kind of like an egg. You know, it's a very hard shell, but a gooey inside. And they're being very careful for that reason. So that's a problem for us, and I understand that. Hopefully, there's really two things that will solve this tremendously if it can be done. One is hopefully in the next few months, we won't have a vaccine yet, but we may have medication that will make this nothing more than a, a flu. In other words, you know, it, it, you're not going to die from it. It won't have the same level of severity. And secondly, if we can have instant testing. And that's something as an industry we have to push for. No, no one person can do it individually. I wish I could give you a better answer. No, thank you for your response. I, re I really appreciate that because the, the last point that he was making there um, on, on us having the consistency and integrity of, of sharing with travelers this information I think is important. So thank you. Thank you for responding. And, and it's, a, it's a very valid uh, question, but Vanessa, even uh, here for our area in Hawaii, because that was the big discussion too. Can we really test people um, um, efficiently um, so these tests are valid. I mean, whenever you, you are going into an island environment um, um, like the Caribbean, like Hawaii, like the Seychelles, uh, it, it becomes a whole different game. It's not a black and white approach for everyone in the world. Uh, we have um, Aulian Pon, Pon, I may pronounce your name wrong, and I apologize if I do, uh, raising uh, your hand. Welcome. You have to unmute you, yourself, though. That's a wonderful lady. Aulian, uh, unmute yourself, please. Okay. Uh, so maybe it's not um, working. I understand from, from a chat message um, that we had someone who wanted to say something but didn't know how to raise your hand. Yes. Uh, and, and this I was think, Heinz. I Heinz. think I have it now. Okay, there we go, Aulian. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. And if they don't, just send a chat message or raise your hand like this. And we'll see it. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I am Dr. Oliana Poon from Tourism Intelligence International. I'm calling in from Berlin. Good and morning. Good morning or good afternoon here. Good evening, yes. Oh, good good evening. evening. Well, it's, it's like after eight o'clock in the evening. Doesn't matter. But I think it's really important when we start to look at um, health 
and COVID-19. I think, unfortunately, it's something we have to live with, including the protocols. But I think it's really important for us to think a little bit outside of the box and to look for some innovation, actually. I would like to draw attention to the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, who actually has instituted a one-year visa. Anyone traveling to Barbados right now can stay up to one year. And that's important because if one wants to come and work and live, whatever, there's not a problem. I think we have to think about solutions outside of the box when we think about how we deal with COVID-19. The problem with COVID-19, and I think we need to look at the demographics, the fact is that the older people are suffering. The older people are most likely to be scared, whether it's of crime, whether it's of COVID, whether it's of congregating. Do we have products or are we ready to cater to the young and restless? How are we going to deal with a new, different type of clientele who wants something very different? For the United States, fortunately, what we've been seeing is that local travel or travel within the United States will be picking up and booming more than even international and regional travel. So I think it's something to look forward and to prepare for. But I think the last point I want to make is this. America has less holidays than anywhere else in the world, the, the developing world. Is this not a chance to argue for more paid holidays for the United States? Think about it and think about solutions outside of the box. Thank you. Ar Arlene, I, I love your comments. Um, I, honestly, and I'm, I'm so thankful you made these comments. They are very valid, and I would take note of it. And I think we have, we should have additional discussions on all what you're saying. Yeah, uh, out of the cool. box tourism, specifically, uh, we talked, we talked about this here. Some people talked about it here in Hawaii, uh, because you can come actually to Hawaii and you can stay here for two weeks in your hotel room, and then you're free to stay. So why not cater to people who can actually do this, like retired people who can stay longer. So instead of renting uh, hotel rooms or vacation apartments by days, rent them by months. So these are definitely very valid things. There's Talib and then there's also Heinz Niederhoff, I think was trying to get the attention, I'm not sure. So let's let's start with Talib. And thank you, Arlen, for, uh, for your comments. Um, I well, think we should have more discussions on it. Dr. Poon has touched on very important issues. You know, when we talk about domestic tourism now, 70% of travel in the United States is domestic tourism. 70%. So that's something that you should look at very carefully. Now, the developing world, on the other hand, does not have that formula at all. In the developing world, tourist is only somebody that's with blue eyes and blonde hair coming from Europe or coming from the States to them. They treat them like, like outside creatures coming from heaven. And the people of the country don't travel inside the country. They don't know their country. In the United States, that's not the case at all, at all, which is a very, very important issue. Now, having said this, I must also say that we have to think outside of the box, like Dr. Poon said. It's not just the issue of how many visa days do you take. It's the government have to look at themselves. There is now some countries are thinking of three days holidays, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, not just Saturday and Sunday. That would, that would, and then you extend the working hours of the day. That would help a lot. I think in some of the countries around the world, even vacations that are not very well defined from the beginning, you have to issue a very important calendar of vacations. And when are the days off? One year ahead at least, and extend them as much as you can. In, in Spain, they have the so-called puentos. Puentos are the bridges. For example, you have Saturday, Sunday off. Monday is the working day and Tuesday is the day off. So many people are tempted to take Monday so they can't connect the four days together. This is thinking outside of the box. I completely agree with Dr. Poon. I think she's made very, very important points. Thank you so much. Thank you, Talib. But maybe we go to uh, Heinz Niederhoff. Sounds German, so you must be joining us from Germany also. Guten Abend. Uh, no, I'm joining you from beautiful California. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right outside Los Angeles. Talking about Hawaii, Jürgen, uh, just a little story uh, which affects uh, your destination. The first, we brought, I was working in the 70s for a continent, for a tour operator here in Beverly Hills. We had an inbound, outbound business primarily to Hawaii and to Europe. 
we brought the first German group, an international group, to Hawaii in 1974. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was staying at that time at the Biltmore, which today is uh, the Hyatt Regency Hotel. Right. Times were quite different. It was a big uh, to do at that time <clears throat> to get Europeans to Hawaii, and the papers in the news uh, uh, media was full of the, the first arrival. Uh, I've been in the tourism business all my life. Um, I have had it uh, a large companies. One, uh, was a German-American company, the uh, tours here in North America, uh, mobbing tours and so forth. Today I'm a consultant uh, to several uh, industries like uh, river cruise companies, to uh, car rental companies, all having to do business from the States uh, to, uh, to Europe. Uh, and it, it pains me when I see you know, what has become of our business, especially here. When I see other countries, Germany being one, uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, several other European countries, of course, uh, where business is picking up and tourism is picking up in Baden-Baden. It's a, a resort town which I represent here in the United States. Our business, the European business, is up now 50% what it was last year at this time. So there is movement. But here in the United States, we are <coughs> yes, standing still. Uh, and it has to do with all of us. And we are trying to find ways you know, to communicate to the powers to be, uh, to make progress. But I think it starts <clears throat> also with ourselves. Uh, the big business here in the United States, as we all know, is wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. We're getting conflicting uh, uh, advice uh, from the top of the government, you know, from the governors, uh, from the mayors. Uh, but bottom line is, you know, uh, wearing a mask help, uh, helps. It is uh, concerning to me when I wear a mask and get into an area where I get uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, not physically attacked, you know, but, but just by, you know, what are you doing? Uh, and this, we have to, we have to get a message out. All of us uh, in the industry and all the Companies, we now please wear a mask. I think we can get over this, but you know, it's only when we all work together and that starts with ourselves. No, and, and, and definitely, I, Heinz, uh, I, I, I agree with you. Heinz, uh, there's the second part that I think we're going to have to consider. Again, this is speaking in the United States, but there's a huge debate in the United States if school will start or not start again. And different types of schools are going. So for example, my grandchildren were given the choice of four days online or two days of in-classroom learning. If they take the two days, that it's means, yeah, that they're given to, yeah, they, each child can make its own decision. So uh, my granddaughter, for example, is taking four days of online education. My grandson is taking two days of full days in school. What that means though, is that there's now a large pocket of time during the school year that people are looking, especially for domestic tra travel, because the, uh, we're already talking about, can they come visit places of historical interest, et cetera, et cetera. And they ha they'll have three or four days each week where they'll be have creative time to be able to use it. Now, of course, this is middle and upper middle class. I understand that. But those are the people who also have the finances to be able to do it. But when we're thinking out of the box, at least in the American concept, how we integrate tourism with education is going to be a tremendous opportunity for the tourism industry and things that we need to be thinking about, especially um, as Talib has pointed out again, 70% of tourism in the United States is domestic tourism. So again, I realize I'm speaking specifically about the United States, but many other countries may also want to do that. Um, but no one, I know in Europe, the kids are going back to school um, for five days. In the United States, that it's unfortunately turned into a political hot potato also, but it does appear it's gonna be these types of situations where um, in California, Los Angeles just canceled its school for the next semester, for the fall semester. So there'll be no public school until January. 
It'll be only online education that you can take at the time you want to take it. And that means young families are gonna have a lot of free time to be able to travel. Thank you, Peter. We actually have three people raising hands and I had some chat messages too. So in order, what we have right now is Kotonga Lungo. We have Deepak uh, from Nepal and Severine Obertelli uh, wanted to contribute. Uh, so maybe we can start with Kotongo Lungo. Uh, Kotongo, uh, you're, you're on, just unmute yourself. Let us know where you're from, uh, even though I know where you're from, but uh, so everyone else does. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jorgen, and uh, also I want to thank you all the participants uh, on this forum. Um, my name is Katongorungo. I'm calling you from Lusaka, Zambia, and uh, I work for ProFlight Zambia. It's an, an, an airline as a flight operations assistant uh, in a flight dispatch. Uh, as you have, uh, as you are aware, most of the the most affected sector in this COVID, which has been affected in addition to lodges and tourism, it's aviation. We are talking of uh, airlines have been affected. We are talking of people have been fired. We are talking of British Airways, political, all that. So now, coming to the issue of uh, the forum that we are talking, one of the issues, COVID has also affected even the recurrences of our pilots, they can't come into US, especially USA, you know. That's why we have uh, Delta Airlines, which trains most of the captains. Now, because of that COVID, others are, we don't have much flights into that. So it has really affected our tourism industry. Not only that, USA was also, we do have a lot of tourism, tourists who come into Zambia, especially in Fue, Victoria Falls. Tourism as foreign, as well. Now, coming to the issue, I want to concur with Dr. Peter Taro as well as uh, Tareb Rifai. The issue of uh, tourists coming into a country, say I'm coming into Washington, then being quarantined for 14 days, it's, it's, it's posing a challenge as people would not want to be to stay in a hotel for 14 days. Maybe the visa we are given for two weeks. By that time, the visa is out. So maybe I would concur with Dr. Peter Taro to put in a recommendation on our behalf to our DELF organization that each lodge, it should be mandatory. It should be mandatory for each lodge, hotel, lodges, resorts, to employ at least one EHT, environmental health technician, or a nurse, medical practitioner, to check on the guests who are coming on to, into that lodge. That will also help out to ease this 14 day quarantine because they will be checked. They go out, that medical practitioner, health, health environmental technician, or a doctor, it should be mandatory by World Health Organization to put it into their protocol so that as I come into to visit Washington, for example, I shouldn't be crossed for 14 days, I need to, to, to visit. I've, we, we say time is money. Maybe I have meetings, I have to do businesses than being quarantined. And this is where the challenge is. People are failing to travel because what am I going to be doing 14 days quarantined in a, or in a hotel than instead of me doing what I'm supposed to be doing there. So maybe this is where now, I want to concur with Dr. Peter Tarazos, he said that we should, the two said we should, solutions should be found. One of the solutions is employ a health technician. Those are qualified medical practitioners. Each guest who comes there, they check on the guest, temperatures, all that forms the feeling at the lodge, then they can be released. As long as uh, we, we hand sanitizers, masks are within one. I think that is, it will also help. I thank you. Thank you. Peter, you want to respond to this? No, I. Um, if it could be implemented, it would be wonderful. Um, I will tell you one of the big problems right now in the United States is that our medical people are so overwhelmed. I don't know if we'd be able, and we have so many hotels. The economy, the scale is so large in this country. We might be able to do it for just a few hotels, but we not, would certainly not be able to do it to every hotel in every major city. 
Um, currently, for example, I teach the medical school here. Our students are being almost immediately being put right into hospitals to serve as backup people. So um, there's only, uh, you know, so many places, they can, we can only have them work 18 hours a day. Um, but um, I think your suggestion is a good idea. I, it just would have to be on a more limited scale. I think though for the present moment in the United States, the concentration will be on domestic tourism and not on international tourism. No, and, and, and Peter, you're right. I mean, we have way too many hotels to do this, but it is a good idea in some cases. For instance, this morning, I was told that uh, this was only from one airline, and I, I'm sure there are going to be more in this situation, that Air Portugal pilots um, are required to stay in quarantine. So basically, they're going to be out of a job, and that's why Air Portugal limited flights from seven days, uh, from seven flights a week to one or two flights a week because they don't have enough pilots really to serve sure. routes to the United States. Um, and if this medical assistance could be given in hotels where these uh, pilots stay, maybe this is a good suggestion. And, um, and it may also work in other countries where we have a different situation, like in Zambia or in, in, in African countries. Uh, where this service could be provided to encourage uh, tourism at some point. Uh, Taleb, go ahead. Yes, I think the issue of two weeks quarantine is out of the question. It's going to kill our tourism industry. Nobody's going to travel if they know that they're going to stay. Even coming back to your own country, staying for two weeks is not a solution at all. Sure. I think the solution should be in the testing. Testing, testing, and testing. I think if we, if we can improve the testing, and I know that in Germany, they have quite advanced in this. If they can do the testing in 24 hours, 48 hours, get results before you travel. Then when you land somewhere, you test it again. It's okay. Then you can decide whether you can get your people in or not. That's, that's the key. Even vaccines, I don't think will work as good as testing would. Now, I know that I promised everybody and you promised, you asked us not to speak about politics. When I heard our good friends from Germany living in San Francisco talking about masks, and when I heard about the schools mentioned by Peter, it's a matter of leadership here. You know, if you don't take things seriously, that's what you end up with, unfortunately. And unfortunately, in the States, things were not taken seriously. I'm sorry to say this, but you can't just give conflicting messages to people, you can't just take it so lightly. I mean, the United States is not the only example in the world. Of other examples, Brazil, Mexico, India, all the all the countries that are led by presidents, if I could call as populists, whether they're from the right, left, or the right, east, right, I don't care. But this is something that is very, very important now. I'm sorry to have gotten into that, but I had to. Thank no, you. thank no, thank you very much, uh, Taleb. We have um, a Deepak from Nepal, Severine, and then. We have uh, Ramsey here from Hawaii raising hands. So let's start with Deepak. Uh, welcome, Deepak. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste, Jurgen. Namaste, Dr. Rifai. Namaste. Peter and all the friends. Uh, hey, Deepak. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to share some uh, information which we can relate with other countries also. You know, the, in Nepal, uh, the tourism is a sector which is uh, talked by everybody but uh, understood by very, very few. So it is you know, sometimes very, very difficult to convince. Maybe this is the situation in many countries. Uh, I would like to give some, a very small example. Uh, very recently, the government of Nepal, uh, we opened uh, you know, the shopping malls, uh, the grocery shops, uh, public transport, many things. But, uh, but uh, uh, the, the tourist services are still uh, in, in, uh, in, in a kind of lockdown. So now what I did is, uh, I, I did two, three things. I calculated one data, like in, in, in this lockdown, we had a uh, death uh, by road accident. It was uh, 120, even in lockdown. Uh, death by uh, landslide, it was more than 50. And similar type of uh, data I collected. And then uh, did a kind of survey uh, about the fear cycles of uh, general people. In, in May, June, it was 90 plus. In, in July, uh, sorry, May, April, it was 90 plus. In July, it was less than 20. So uh, we went to the authorities uh, with these facts and then they understood and they are, I think, hopefully in few days of time, 
they are uh, opening up for uh, domestic tourism because um, uh, the, the tourism is one of the most disciplined sector in tourism we have to win trust to do the business of uh, uh, so so uh, we are more careful about the, the visitors so these facts help us to convince the authorities so hopefully in few days, in few weeks of time we are opening up for uh, for domestic tourism uh, and then uh, thank you Talib, uh, for giving your feedback a uh, few, day, few days ago that helped us to convince the government and then we are starting with domestic tourism and uh, uh, after uh, four weeks we are also starting with uh, opening our international border also. At this time uh, I would like to suggest one thing uh, since uh, you know, uh, as, as, as Talib very rightly said uh, <clears throat> the testing is the solution not the quarantine the fear cycles is down, uh, the, the perceived threat is very, very less, and the willingness to travel is more. So at that time, maybe uh, through rebuilding the travel, we can, we can draft some uh, a new strategy to restart tourism, uh, how to live uh, through, uh, through uh, uh, COVID and how to do business. Stuff. Maybe uh, I can volunteer if everybody agree to, to draft some uh, kind of a small strategy where we can finalize this may help many emerging countries who are willing to open their destinations. Thank you. No, th thank you. Thank you very much, Deepak. And yeah, we would welcome. Deepak, why don't you do that? Yes, absolutely. I would love to see you do that. Please send it to us. Send it, and and we'll, you know, massage it a little bit with your permission and get it out. Thank you. Thank you. And that's I, that's the type of support, uh, uh, Deepak. I'm 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 looking for, and I think we had some good feedback. We we really touched some really good new issues here already in today's conversation and, and we still have a lot of people wanted to speak. So we're, we're getting some things, uh, we're happy. So let's go to Severin Opertelli. I think you're joining us from the UK if I'm not mistaken, right? You're welcome. Yes, hi, hello you again and hello everyone. And um, yeah, thank you very much for this um, beautiful safe space actually where to share like opinions um, and very open to everyone. Uh, so. Myself, I am an executive coach and a consultant. And um, well, my mission when I set myself up was to actually take mindfulness and rationalization into governance. Uh, because there is, you know, for what, uh, because it's a, it's a very timely as well sort of a topic at the moment. And um, listening to your conversations, and um, all of the comments, I mean, the situation now in the US and the comment that uh, um, uh, Dr. Taleb uh, made and as well, you know, the suggestion from Katongo and Deepak and so forth. Uh, what, what I see is that on one side, we have a governance, you know, in terms of public governance, especially in the US, which is not at the moment, uh, like in many other countries, so I wouldn't actually go and point out you know the US particularly but the topic is about that at the moment but it's not actually helping people neither financially neither to actually meet their needs um, on the other side of course there is all the crisis uh, in the travel sector but there there is leadership and governance as well which is private so my point is you know as as a coach as someone that believes in leadership that comes from the inside and can be expressed by anyone independently from the role either you are in the government or you are in the private sector what i see is that you know is there the possibility for example because here we have like a um very international audience which to me is a very very beautiful brainstorming of you know people coming out from ideas from all over the world but is there the possibility actually you know and i'm asking this question to peter to actually take that into a more like uh, you know american discussion because what i see of course which is um which is the way that well let's say let's call it the american dream uh, you know everything is very much around you know around the financial empowerment of people okay um which is great, okay, which can, that can give opportunity. And of course, money is as well power. And of course, all the money which is now lost in terms of travel, in terms of economy, is now lost. 
And on the other side, you have people that actually are willing to travel. So how can this be taken to a government that doesn't see that rationally, because I'm talking about mindfulness and about rationality, but how can this be shown, you know, in a way which is calm and, and actually, you know, shown with data, because it can be very, very, very done. So is there a, an initiative that is actually brought forward of putting people together? Because, you know, in terms of the influence power that people can have, one leader can have one influence. If you put a few together, that have a common vision, that can actually give a lot of weight. So that's my question a little bit to Peter. I'm not sure I understood exactly where you're going, and I'm not sure all your data is correct. So I have to think about both of those things. First of all, the United States, if we're talking the United States, most decisions are made on the state and local level. Not, this is not the United Kingdom, nor is it a European country, which is much more centralized. The United States is a federal system, and therefore many states have uh, their own system. In Texas, for example, we have a very good council where private business and the government work together, hand in hand, to try to solve problems, et cetera. So while there are some national policies, um, one, those are much less important on a great extent than what goes on within the states you see tremendous differences between the way one state operates and another state operates. So again, we, this is more almost, they, they were originally 13 independent countries that formed the union. And so that, so that there's a very different way of, of seeing the world. Um, maybe it's better, maybe it's wrong, not better, but that's the reality. Now the other side of that is, I think on the whole, and I know many of the people in the US government they have, they have taken things extremely seriously. Things are not necessarily reported correctly, but they've been taken very seriously. Um, and I think that's a misnomer that has gone around the world, but it's not necessarily true. So um, we, for example, are right now preparing a second uh, set of um, money to be given out to anyone who's unemployed. The travel and tourism industry has received large amounts of grants of money. And uh, I think it's important to know all the facts because if we don't know all the facts, then we end up making some very big errors. You cannot replicate a European system to the American system. That doesn't mean one is better or worse, they're just different systems. But a state in Texas is bigger than any country in Europe. The economy of Texas is bigger than any European country. So that it's almost its own independent country in a level a way. And those decisions are made always on the local level, uh, one way or the other. So what you read in the news and what takes place in reality are not necessarily true. The worst state was the one that claims to take the most, which was New York State. Half of the deaths in the United States from COVID took place in New York. And if I can speak on a personal level, I'm not sure my mother did not die because of the misnomer of um, the state of New York, because they took people who were sick and put them into, uh, in England, you call them care homes. Here we call them senior citizen homes. Um, so you had over 30,000 people die in New York. The same number of people have been infected in Florida as New York, and only 3,000 people have died. So you see a very different perspective on the way Florida handled things and New York handled things. So I just want to, you know, I wouldn't bring this up, except I think it's important to know all the facts and not just what, a, and that's what I meant by the media. People more and, must, more and more are not believing what the media say. Because unfortunately, the media have become so partisan that they have political agenda and they're not really giving real facts. And so if you don't live here, you're getting a perspective which is not necessarily true. Yeah, to, to I, an extent, I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, Sarah. Yeah, no, thank you, Peter, for clarifying that. And, yes. and um, you know, what, what I wanted to, 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 to say on this is that, yes, you have all the different countries with a different sort of governance. However, when you're talking about domestic travel in the US, 
that also means traveling between states, right? That's right, so, absolutely. So, so, so my point is from a, is a, on another level. Uh, my point is on another level is that maybe the conversation needs to be taken, you know, like there is this beautiful space here in rebuilding travel, which is international, but needs to be taken between states. But yes, yes, right? no. For example, so so that's you know in terms of because sure. because in in terms of finding that kind of finance yeah. because the the financial weight of the travel sector goes beyond the borders of, of Texas course. and Florida and California and whatever you want to do. So people from, from, from Texas wants to go to California. They want to go, you know, so yes. that's, that's actually the way. So, and that can be dealt only actually going and leveraging at a higher level. So that's only the-, the Well, even the, that, let me just correct you a little bit. For example, yeah. I live in Texas. I could not go to New York right now. Yeah. I cannot go to my mother's grave in New Jersey because yeah. New Jersey is not permitting people from 36 states to come into New Jersey. Now that's domestic travel. But my mother died six or seven months ago uh, and I cannot visit her grave because it's a $15,000 fine if I cross the border into New Jersey. I'm sorry, we have, we, I'm sorry. go ahead, uh, Charlie. I'm sorry about your mother. God bless you. her yeah. Yeah. But Peter, allow me to disagree with you. I of think course. in spite of the fact that the United States is different in its political system, there is a leadership problem. Leadership must be inspiring here. And the leadership in the United States altogether is not giving the right messages, unfortunately. It's not helping. It's not how much money you dedicate you pay. You can pay, I'm sure the United States paid money more than any other country in the world has paid. But the end result that this money was absorbed, nothing was done on the on the on the ground. On the ground. We need to send the right signals. And unfortunately, the central government in the United States is not sending the right signals, even leaving it up to each state. I wish you were an advisor to Trump because he, he refuses even that, that logic. He thinks that he has the upper hand. Although okay. that's not the fact. I know that. You know that. So okay. I think. Okay, I'm not going to get into the political debate because I don't think that's good for this. Um, I think, though, that, you know, tourism is one industry within a country. We have to be very careful. If we only are tourism centric, we will make other mistakes because political leaders balance many issues together. And so as important as tourism is to me, I also realize were I the leader of a country, I would balance. And you know, we're gonna push what we want and I understand that, but country, governments do in a, a, a large number of balancing acts. And right now in the United States to make it more complicated is this is in, in four months we're having an election. And that election is gonna have tremendous, for example, one party in the United States wants to raise taxes radically. If it does that, it will kill tourism. Well, and, and, and now we're getting into the political. Yeah. We don't want no, to I, get but I want, I want, I want, I want to help you can. <laughs> because I would love any... to respond to it, but I better not. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. but, but there, I just want Tyler to understand there are many, many sides to all of these issues. And you cannot necessarily accept what's seen by one perspective or the other. Because uh, there's a huge debate. I strongly encourage not to read it's just the papers. But go and actually look at the policy papers. In fact, and Peter, the situation in the United States is not a good one. That's the fact on the ground. Yeah, it, it's. I think the coordination in this country, uh, without uh, pointing any yeah. fingers, the coordination is missing. Yeah. Um, the the message we're sending to the rest of the world, the message we're sending from the central part of our government, is confusing. To put it in nice words. Yeah. And uh, it, that becomes dangerous on a local level because the local level cannot really react. The local level should react in many cases because it's getting stopped by other powers. So it's a power struggle back and forth. And I can see it here. Anyone joining me here from Hawaii, we can see it on a daily basis. We're struggling with the federal government to keep our state safe. That's how I see it. But let's go to Ramsey. He's actually joining us here from Hawaii. Aloha, Ramsey. Yeah. Yeah, aloha, Jargon. Thank you, and uh, thank you everyone for the 
stimulating conversation. I just wanted to pick up, uh, Peter, just what you're saying. In your original criteria, I thought there was also another line, and you kind of just talked about that. That scale and timing, a lot of these issues would be taken care of depending if it's a near, mid, or long-term responses. Because a lot of our concern right now is how to get back into it quickly, but should that now become the new paradigm and the new way of doing things? So as you suggested, once we have, once we have a, a vaccine and or test, if you flip it around, the sequence right now is testing, vaccine, and then we have on, on we go. But a lot of this tension right now is happening because of the time to try to respond and get back into things. So I would think there's scaling and there's timing. The scaling has to do with states, federal government, and as well as international. As, as Jurgen was saying, one of the things we're looking at here is the impact of mass tourism on a small island versus community or small uh, interstate tourism. And that may be another question to ask, what kind of tourism are we talking about and what do we want to get back to? And, and do we jump right back to, into a mass tourism model or do we find a different way of doing that? So I think there's different criteria in your four, four things that you laid out yeah. that we want to uh, put out and look at each one of those levels. I think the fifth one, which all of us, I think, experience is the concept of cultural worldviews on how we see these things. Yeah. Whether it's a head covering, a face covering, a foot covering, all of those types of things play into the role. If it's based on that versus the health question, which is what you started out with, then we begin to look at priorities. And I would suggest in many ways, we haven't come up with shared priorities at this point in time. So we're having a conflict both in values, but also in a conflict of priorities. And we're seeing that in the United States, and I'm sure we'll see it elsewhere. Um, and that comes down to really, again, avoid in leadership and or an aspiration to lead in a different manner. So those are the observations I'm making from what, what we've heard here before or on the call today. I'd just like to also thank uh, Katongo for his comment. Um, we are also ex ha have been experiencing the 14-day quarantine issue just interstate um, between our islands as well as uh, between over the ocean. I, I would like to offer that the sequencing may be a an issue as well. What if someone quarantined 14 days before they came versus after they came? Or maybe if they did seven days on one end, seven days on the other. But even as we talk about that, we're negating the sequence issue again, uh, Peter, yes, because yes. at some point in time, that won't be the issue. That's not the best way to deal with it. That is a near-term response to getting the business starting up again, rather than asking perhaps a more preferred question, how do we travel safely in the post-COVID world? Uh, in the same way with education, how do we educate our children without having to go back to reinforce antiquated and or irrelevant systems of education? So I think how we frame the questions are just as important as the solutions that we're going to arrive at. But I think it's, it's platforms like this that we can begin to pose those kinds of questions um, as long as we're not pressured into er, uh, from urgency to emergency. I think that's one of the other issues is dealing with that from a time and scale standpoint. So thanks, Jurgen, and thanks to everybody else. No, thank, thank you. <laughs> and you are 100% correct, by the way. And I, I think even medically, we may see first before testing and before a vaccine, we may see a medication. And the medication may be, a, so we don't even know the sequence yet. And you're a thousand percent correct. And uh, we're going to see all sorts of other issues. Um, football games. How do you put a hundred thousand people into a football game? And yet sports is a huge business that will, you know, that will impact things. So um, these are all major issues that are going to have to be thought through. And it's going to take a while. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Peter. We have um, Dov also. He's joining us from uh, Tel Aviv in Israel. Uh, welcome, Dov. Thank you so much. Uh, Shalom and aloha to everyone. Uh, uh, hello, my dear neighbor. Uh, I must first of all start with you. I mean, I, 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 I find it difficult to say it, but I, there's not even one single word that I disagree with. I agree with every word you said. Uh, on the on the issues of the political leadership, the price that we pay all of us for the lack of political leadership, uh, I agree with you on the issue of the quarantine that 
you can't put this that we cannot continue with the two weeks quarantine in the in the tourism uh, game uh, uh, I, I agree with everything i'm glad that you're my neighbor let's uh, to have you all on this board. I would like to say a few words that maybe some might find uh, pro provocative, but I really have to say this. I mean, we are, we are rebuilding travel. That is the, that is the whole, whole theme of, of what we're doing. And we can't change the politicians. We can't get into their shoes, into their, uh, uh, their considerations that they have to take. We have to make a clear stand. And a clear stand has to be that we have to do everything in our power to save as many people who are completely dependent on this industry. We can't come up with wonderful lectures about how we have to wait. We can't wait anymore. I mean, we are long in time. We have to come up with very clear and easy solutions. And I heard some wonderful idea, uh, ideas tonight about things that I, I personally didn't know about. For example, the, the issue of the Aruba model by, by, by Patrick Melchior, that is saying that basically everyone can come testing on uh, at the airport 24 hours, within 24 hours, a solution. Those kind of solutions or the, 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 the solution of the Maldives uh, that is doing a, a wonderful job in trying to rebuild rebuild travel for their country uh, or the wonderful idea of uh, Aurelian Poon of the one-year visa on Barbados. I mean, those are the kind of solutions. I think that we as a, uh, as a platform should make it into a very simple and clear uh, message to the world and to our political leaders. Listen, guys, this cannot continue. We can't continue like this. We have to come up with clear uh, uh, solutions that will save the lives of so many people who are dependent partly on us, on us as leaders of this industry. Um, I think also there is one more issue that we cannot, uh, you know, ignore any longer, and that is the issue: what is tourism in the post-COVID model? I mean, what are we going to? change what are we going to repair in you know in the way that we behave to mother earth uh, before the crisis how are we going to create a new model that is taking the community as part of the, the thinking of rebuilding tourism rebuilding travel uh, do, those are two my my, my short com comments sorry to uh, not to have followed your complete uh, plan of the four issues and by the way my uh, sympathy um, for your the death of your mother. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dolphin. Um, always inspiring to, to hear from you. And uh, we have um, three more people uh, wanted to speak, and we're coming close, sh surely um, to the end of this discussion, not to the end of what we're doing. I think we're learning a lot. Um, before we go to uh, Mike King, uh, let me also recognize Alexandra in um, Montenegro. Uh, she is has been working with us extensively. We're going to make an announcement probably in the next few days um, about uh, something big happening with rebuilding our travel in the Balkan region with, under her leadership in Montenegro. Also wanted to just say hello to Dr. Gulen Hashmi. She was a guest on our show. She's joining us from Pakistan. Uh, welcome and, and thanks for participating. Let's go to Mike King. Tell us, Mike, where you are. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, so let me try to help you here. Just click on, there we go, okay. I'm Mike King from Fredericksburg, Virginia. I'm with Travel Leaders, and I agree with a lot of what's been said. Uh, I have to take exception with Peter. Um, the media is more than Fox News, if that's what you were trying to say, because that's what it sounded like. Uh, there's a very, very good media system in the United States, and it does present facts other than Fox News. Um, I don't think you can blame one party for raising taxes because there's one party that talks about eliminating deficit, but they spend more than any other administrations ever, including this one. Uh, right. So you can't blame that one way or another. It belongs to everybody. The biggest issue I keep hearing over and over and over and over is test, test, test. And let's just be very open that we have a national, totally pathetic disaster in this country about doing tests. 
And until we get to the point that we can process test, everything that's been said about going internationally, it's absolutely hurting the industry terribly is because they can't get a test right at the point of entry into any country and get results within 20 to 30 minutes. That's what we need. And we're wasting a lot of dollars or losing a lot of dollars of employing people because people can't travel. We're losing a lot of companies that are just going to have to go under if we don't get this thing under control in the next few months. Um, and we can have all the bailouts here in the US we want to, but until we start doing the testing and make it easily and readily available, I think that is the issue that we've got to deal with more than anything else of helping our political leaders understand the need to whatever we need to do, whether it's the um, war act of being able to process these things or whatever, but that is the key element I keep hearing over and over that we need test. And I think that's an incredibly important issue. Um, we met with clients last night and that was a big part of the conversation in the Zoom meeting with them was the need to have testing so that you can know who is positive and who is not. So yeah, that's, it, it, that's definitely becoming an issue that's even here again locally talking about my little island. Uh, we now can only facilitate half of the tests we were able to facilitate last week because uh, resources have to be shifted rightfully, I have to say, because we have resources. They're going to Florida, to Texas, to Arizona, to states where the problem is by far worse. But we also need the testing here. And I agree with you, our government, uh, uh, no matter where you stand politically, let's, these are facts, is failing in regards to providing these essential services. And when you look at other jurisdictions, uh, even in the United Arab Emirates, where Emirates is now as an airline able to test every passenger before they board a flight, what is missing here? We're the United States of America, you know? We exactly. Have, so I, it, I it agree is, with you. We, we should have a test before we get on a plane. Yes, and, and so that is an issue, and it sometimes makes my blood boil. I'm sorry, I don't want to get excited here, but <laughs> it's, um, uh, but let's go to, we have uh, two more people raising hands. We have Arlene um, uh, adding to um, the earlier participation. We also have Patrick uh, coming up. Uh, Arlene, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. I would like to really commend and comment on, um, on, the, on, the, on the contributions from Tel Aviv and from um, Taleb, but also from Hawaii. I think all of us are wanting tourism to get back to normal. And I think we really have to ask ourselves and tell ourselves and really understand normal is the problem. The kind of tourism that we had before, the mass tourism that didn't care about the environment, is that the normal that we want to get back to? Think about the cruise lines and that kind of normal. And I think that really is a problem. I think we really have to ask ourselves what kind of tourism post Corona? And how can Corona be the single most important opportunity for our industry to get it right, to get it sustainable, to get it responsible, and to really and truly be resilient. And of course, you mentioned earlier the importance of people, local communities, and of course, the environment, which we tend to forget a little bit. But I think very critically on the positive side of things, take Germany and Berlin. Germany this summer is full absolutely full because it did the right things on the one hand but also this weekend in berlin i mean it is absolutely incredibly cheap for locals to visit their own hotels and in the united states how many hotels are actually offering rates to allow people who live locally to enjoy the hotels that they don't normally enjoy so i think there are opportunities if strategies can be put in place to make it a reality now, in Europe, there's what's called the, the um, corona-free corridors. But I think one of the advantages that America has is the road. The people travel by car. So what are the corona-free routes that people can take right now even and stay in hotels because they've been doing it right? 
or doing the right things at least. So I think those are some of the things that I think we need to, um, to take into account. Now, it was considered also um, this whole idea about tourism and new education, but I think we also need to look at tourism and new work. Now, Facebook's people already decided that, you know, it was really great. I don't have to go into the city to work anymore. I can work from home or I can move out where it's cheaper. What if people from Facebook can go to Jordan or Jamaica and work? Would they be considered all right? Why not allow the place to be open so much that people can work from anywhere, travel from anywhere, go anywhere, and what's preventing that? And why can't we not make it happen? Seriously. Thank you. Very good feedback, um, Arlene, and um, glad to have you on board. As far as I can uh, know, you're calling in from Berlin. What's one of my uh, favorite cities? I'm from Dusseldorf, but I have to admit, um, Berlin isn't isn't that bad, and it must be beautiful this time of, of the year. And I know things are booming quite a bit better in Germany uh, than many other countries, even in Europe. And I'm, I'm proud of my old country um, to have done things <laughs> right and have uh, low low numbers. So um, all power to you, and, and please in, enjoy. Um, we have, um, I think, one more. Um, we have Patrick. Uh, Patrick, uh, tell us where you're calling from. Go ahead. Patrick must be from Ireland. <laughs> Thank you, Jürgen. Um, and uh, nice town, uh, Dusseldorf. Beautiful town, Berlin. Uh, my mother is actually from Neuss, very close to Dusseldorf. So Neuss, I used to live in Karst. I am, ah, there you go. <laughs> so I'm, I'm calling from Aruba. Um, with the Caribbean perspective on uh, all of this. Uh, Taleb, it's nice to see you again also. Been a while. Um, I actually thought uh, Dr. Alian made uh, a final very strong statement. So, you know, I'm like, okay, I have to, I have to follow that. But um, since Dov, uh, you know, challenged me to say something about the model that we're, um, we're um, handling in Aruba, I think it's really uh, essential to say something. Um, just um, we know that uh, you know Caribbean islands are opening up to uh, the United States. Uh, currently, we are closed, for example, to uh, Latin American countries because of the situation there. Uh, I know Jamaica has uh, also opened their doors and um, let's say relaxed their their initial. Um, let's say, uh, restrictions uh, to, if I'm not mistaken, seven or 10 days uh, prior to travel that you're allowed to, um, you know, test and send in a test. Same thing goes for St. Lucia. Aruba, we're still a little bit um, hesitant of, um, let's say, alleviating the, uh, the strict 72 hours that we require. On top of which, we have 18, we have marked 18 states in the United States as hot zones. For anybody that wishes to look at how we've organized it, I recommend that you go to aruba.com um, and look at the health requirements or the, you know, the entry requirements that we've put up. It's basically stating for those hot zones that uh, are, are uh, also mentioned in this, uh, uh, in this forum, um, we require uh, pre-testing before you board, before you get to our island. Before you do anything else, these hot zones have to be tested, these people, within 72 hours of your departure time. Now, the, the states outside of the hot zone have, the, have another option to test upon arrival. Uh, when you test upon arrival, uh, we have a system where you go into quarantine for 24 hours max. The results regularly come in between six and eight hours after testing. Um, and we're not making statements here, but you know there are so many labs in the U.S. There, uh, and I believe Mike alluded to something like that. How can you not get it right? I mean, it should be so easy. Um, and we're getting a lot of negative feedback from potential travelers that you know our our demands are outrageous. And you know how can how do you think you can make this work? Well. Last weekend, we, uh, we opened up to the United States, uh, our first weekend, and uh, we actually received 4,000 visitors, which is 15% of what we usually got, get, you know, uh, compared to last year. 
but it's a start and uh, so far so good feedback is really uh, overwhelming people are happy to be back and uh, this is just a synopsis of, of everything that we're going through but I, I did want to comment and uh, you know make sure that we communicate about the things that we're implementing I mean we're a very small island uh, 120,000 people live here and our tourism is the number one absolutely the number one thing that we do 93% of our GDP depends on tourism. So you can imagine where we're at at the moment uh, economically. So hopefully uh, things will open up and things will, uh, you know, uh, look for the better. I just wanted to share that. And um, anybody who has any questions, please uh, send them in. Uh, it's, it's all good. And uh, I think Talat, yes, Mr. Rifai. <laughs> yeah. no, thank you so much. Jürgen, may I say something? Please. Okay. I don't think anybody should blame Aruba for, for any of the procedures that they're putting in place. It's the minimum that you do to protect yourself. You're a small island, you're a clean island, you're a green island. And I think, going back to what was said by Dr. Poon here, the opportunities that can come out of this are the following. First of all, we must not put all our eggs in one basket. We must diversify our markets. So I think you've, you've, you, you have to try to think of markets outside the United States now. Although I know it's easiest to come from the United States, the tour operators have to get to learn how to bring people from all over the world. And there are direct flights from Europe, there are direct flights from the Middle East, direct flights from other parts of the world. Two, domestic tourism is an opportunity. We have never looked at domestic tourism for a long period of time. What we have done with domestic tourism is we've relegated it to the last end. Now domestic tourism needs a completely different state of mind to think differently, or to speak the language of the people, or to cater for different products. Our tour operators have to start thinking about it. I know in small islands that would not work. Inter islands, it would be you and Jamaica, you and Aruba, Aruba, you and uh, Trinidad, you and Cuba even, any other any other island there. I think it's, these are opportunities that we must pick up on. Thank you so much. Uh, th th thank you, Talib. And I also have a question for, for Patrick. When you say you have 18 states identified as hot zones, how do you identify them? You identify people by residence, people by what ID they carry, um, how were they travel? Did they travel to a hot zone before? Um, how, how do you keep this uh, yes. in check? Basically, the, uh, the marker is uh, uh, your residency. So if you reside in uh, uh, one of them is Ohio, for example, uh, I think uh, uh, from the top of my head, uh, Florida obviously is one of them. They were identified um, together with the RIVM in the Netherlands, which is the, uh, you know, the national uh, health um, department of the Netherlands and the health department here. Um, and to get also looking at you know what the the, the CDC and um, the WHO were predicting on you know what the trend would be in the United States and where you know th this whole epidemic has started to flatten out and which states would be less um, you know of a risk. So the threshold that we're um, we're using is uh, actually higher than the one the CDC has implemented. And uh, we, we've we've had some negative comments about that. That you know, our the way that we're uh, trying to protect um, our, our our borders, uh, you know, is not based on any science, et cetera, et cetera. Which is uh, is is too bad. But because we did think about it, and we, you know, it's it's not just about our population, but it's also for the visitor. Obviously, you want to have people protected. You want to have your 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 um, your um, codes in place, your, uh, you know, everything, uh, you know, again, uh, going back to the website, so I don't have to speak for an hour. Uh, we have a, a health and happiness code um, that was that's implemented throughout the island, you know, uh, people need to adhere to uh, certain protocols. And uh, if not, you know, they're closed down. So everything is done to make sure that we can protect both our visitors coming in and, uh, you know, uh, our local population so it's basically basically the answer to the question is the place of your residence is what yeah, matters place of your residence yes right and, and you have a you have an i'm sorry Italian, go ahead i said i've been to aruba a couple of times you haven't been to aruba once in your lifetime you should do that really it's a wonderful place 
Yeah, and in Aruba and also in the Caribbean, you, you have a different situation. You have many all-inclusive resorts, for example, that makes it quite easy to uh, maintain people in one spot. Um, I know Jamaica with the uh, resilient corridor, I think they call it, on a proof corridor, they're trying to keep people in, in one area. I don't know, Aruba, what your structure is, um, but uh, they, uh, these small island states like yourself uh, have a more flex, uh, have way more flexibility than a huge country like the United States. Uh, have an to, advantage, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's definitely an advantage. And Aruba and, has another big advantage, which is it's still connected on some level with the Kingdom of uh, the Netherlands. Yeah, and so it right. has the economic backup that it's not just 110,000 people or 120,000 people on their own. And that, by the way, this shirt is from Aruba. Uh, <laughs> I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, so it, was given, it was given to me by the Aruban police. Amen to that. Yeah, it says on the, it says on the back label. You know. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't, but it, that's where it comes from. But I, I think, you know, the Caribbean is always going to have to be very careful because they have a they're limited populations. And that means that they have to keep, they can't necessarily keep large amounts of medical supplies. There has been a um, brain drain of medical people away from the Caribbean, and that's become an issue. Um, hospitals are some places better than others, but there's, they, their hospital system could easily be overpowered. And if you have a contagious disease that gets out within a population which is only say under 150,000 people, and you get 20,000 people sick, you got a major problem. So um, these islands have got to uh, balance tourism with health and with the local population's ability to function. Um, all, of, yeah, all of what you're mentioning, Peter, is uh, is you know um, is is used to calculate the risk and state right. you know this is this is as far as we can go. Right. Uh, you know, and the whole medical system obviously is, is not huge. It's not uh, extremely large here. So, okay, at what point do we say, you know, we have to close again, or you know, we, we can still we can still carry the risk. So it's it's uh, based on on science actually. The other side of that is that um, the whole issue of airlines and uh, cruises. Somebody mentioned cruises, which are somewhat petri dishes. So that's a real issue. And on the other side is. American Airlines and United now are no longer providing the, they're filling the middle seat. So where they were having social distancing, they're not. And that creates new problems for the Caribbean where transportation is very often uh, connected by foreign airlines, be it KLM or American or um, British Airways, you know, whoever that foreign airline is. So th those are challenges the Caribbean has to face. There are different challenges than we have here in the United States. Yeah. Well, I know I know that multiple um, destinations in the Caribbean require the airlines, uh, you know, all the guests to wear um, masks uh, throughout, you know, their ride to their hotel. Um, there's screening at the ho uh, at the at the airport taking place. Uh, there are health um, specialists at the airport when people come in. You know, and they detect there's 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 screening by these uh, heat uh, monitors, heat sensors. So everything is done to to mitigate uh, risk. Basically, the the fact that you're getting it back in is is a fact. But you know, you, you can you have to do everything within your power to just mitigate that risk and not get to that you know uh, maximum again. Now, the other it, side it, of that is that we're always going to have to measure risk versus opportunity. And there is no 100% safe situation. And I'm glad, uh, Peter, you said that um, because this this is very important to say. We cannot guarantee safety, complete safety, but we can verbalize it to encourage and to do everything we can to keep a destination, uh, keep the virus out. Uh, you know, based on on current uh, on our current information that are changing by the minute. And it's important that uh, anyone could adopt, uh, knows their environment, uh, knows opportunities within the travel and tourism industry in their own country and region. And uh, yeah, starting with domestic yeah. tourism or regional tourism is definitely also something everyone can learn of in the process. So I think we're now 30 minutes over our time. 
And um, I'm, I'm glad we are because I think this was a very productive discussion. Um, we encourage, I encourage everyone to go to rebuilding.travel and just click on contact and add your information or any information that comes up. We're trying to collect it. Uh, we're doing the same on resilience.travel, our latest site, and it's all interactive. We're the same people. Um, so please um, stay in touch. I'm also, uh, we're going into the discussion, so how we can really get to the next step and what we're learning here in this session can go to some of the more important, in some of the more important dis uh, uh, decision-making um, uh, discussions. Uh, so we, we can, I think uh, we're in the position of doing our little small part uh, to get the world out and make this world better for travel and tourism, for safety of our travelers and keep on working what we're doing. We cannot stop what is happening, uh, but we're leaders and as leaders, I think we have to lead. And that's um, the last thing I have to say, except that a, a copy of this uh, session of the video would be on rebuilding.travel in our archive. You can also see and watch all the old videos we have. It's also on the Etobo News um, YouTube channel under the rebuilding uh, subject line. And uh, uh, if there's nothing else, anyone Jürgen, wants if to- people have uh, some particular questions, let them ask specifically on real rebuilding. Rebuilding.travel, yes. And and we, also will, we will get back to them as quickly as we can. Um, That's right. In the end, all tourism on some level is local. So while we can speak on the uh, brand level, on, on the bottom line is what really counts is your industry, your job, your finances, your country, your community, and each one of us has to help everyone else to build so that when we're all stronger, then we all do a lot better. But that means starting on the local level and moving on up. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, you guys have a good evening. Good morning. Aloha from this end. Namaste to you. Salam Aleikum to uh, Taleb and uh, Shalom to Dov and, and uh, guten Abend to Germany. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. And if you feel like uh, 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 attending our next week's session, what will be 12 hours time difference from what this one was, um, and I think Europe is still a good possibility for everyone to attend. Uh, please do. Uh, we love to communicate with you, and uh, we really, really try very hard to make a difference in the industry. And thank you for um, helping us with this. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night.